I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why is this guy playing the Dark Valley or goofing around with the Dark Valley when he should be playing Case Blue and GB2 because he's only on turn uh, four or five of a gazillion turn campaign? Or why hasn't why isn't he playing Asper and Essling and finishing off that? He said that was going to happen really quickly, and now he's got another game out. What the hell? Well, look, there's a reason why I'm doing this. A, it's new and shiny, and it, it's right in front of my face. So I pulled it out, and I looked at the rules, and it looked kind of cool. And then I got the pieces out, and they look kind of cool. And then there's chits and things, and the rules were really interesting. And so I... Well, well, I set it up, <laughs> and uh, it's really interesting. I haven't played anything yet, but uh, I wanted to mention a couple of quick things about the game. Uh, the uh, is clearly a lot of thought because you know I think Ted Brasier has a you know probably a very nice reputation in the industry. I I don't know the guy at all, and uh, there has been lots of comments from folks that oh they were going to wait and see on the dark valley because they didn't want it to be in parentheses another Ted Resia disaster or whatever that means I've only played one other I think of his games and that was uh, Hitler Turns East and I quite enjoyed it and in fact I can see uh, a lot of the perhaps these uh, these games came out within a couple of years of each other uh, maybe three years and uh, I can see the maturity of thinking here for this title uh, coming out of Hitler turns east. I could be completely wrong, but that's how I feel. Uh, just from reading the rules, setting this up, reading chit activation, and reading the and knowing the chit activation system and the command point system in uh, Hitler turns east, there are some similarities here. You don't have to roll for points here. Here it's a little bit different. So oh, the, the few things I wanted to mention were that the, the, a lot of the mechanics of the game, the rule systems, and the way in which things work. Uh, very, it seems at the, at the very uh, high level anyway, uh, subtly tied together. Uh, the action chits availability chart, this thing here, it, uh, it outlines each month how many chits are going to be available for each side. And uh, let's see if I can just zoom out a little bit and I'll show you this, just a, just a little bit of this. So you can see here uh, in you know, June, the axis get... Uh, five and the service get two and then it changes over time right and first reaction to that might be oh well you know uh, i'm being i'm being railroaded down a historical path well it doesn't work out that way uh because those uh the, the germans have when germans have initiative usually in fair weather uh then they will uh they will be able to pick their first chip that they want to play and in mud and winter uh, turns, snow turns, the Soviets, they'll have initiative and they'll get to pick their first unit that they get to play. And you'll notice there's also a number of interesting little uh, chit types. Deep Battle, uh, Combat Zukov, Combat Stavaka, uh, and a number of others, you know, Move and Combat and things like that. And there's uh, one for each of the Panzer Armies and there's the Logistics Chit. So, <clears throat> the there's a limited number of chits that you get to activate. I really like that because some of these games where it's, it's chip, you feel like there's a chip pull mechanic because they wanted to be cool and because be one of the cool boys on the block. Hey, I got chits. And there's 20 chits because the way the game's sized or structured, you need 20 chits. And that's part of the problem I'm having with Aspen Nestling. I don't want to pull 15 chits for a turn. It just at some point, especially playing solo, it just becomes a grind, and you're like, okay, God, another chit. So I like the fact that there's a limited number of chits that if you're within the command range of the various headquarter units, which I'll see if I can find one real quickly. Where are the guys? So here's a army group centers HQ, and the range is three. And so uh, all the units that are within three hexes or maybe it's three moving points, it doesn't matter, whatever it is, uh, are going to get to move. Uh, and uh, move in combat, and if they're mechanized, they're going to get to uh, uh, have a second combat. They may be able to combat, move, and then combat again. I, Like I said, I'm just finished reading the rules. I've got it set up. 
That's, there's that element to it. Now there's another element. So, so, that, so that kind of gives you some historical flavor and feel and the limited number of chits for the Soviets impacts their ability to respond and react to the German activity. So that's interesting too. Uh, the, this Zhukov uh, and, uh, oh, well, there's another chit uh, that's interesting. So there's a mandated ca counterattack uh, concept, which is also kind of derivative of, uh, from Hitler turns east. Uh, and the, and the uh, Stavaka uh, uh, chit uh, gives you a certain, a certain type of activation uh, and allows you to release reserves and things like that. And there's also, if you look at the board, you think, well, there's a lot of Soviet units there, you know, all these guys all the way back here. Uh, I think the order of battle here is, uh, is based on perhaps some more current uh, research or perhaps uh, a part of the you know, World War II revisionist viewpoint that uh, the Soviets weren't all that bad. There are actually several uh, fairly tough units here, these six, eight mech units, where does that go, 36, 33, it goes here, and there's several of those scattered around, and if you were able to combine those, uh, you would have a uh, equivalent fighting force against the Germans for a period of time, assuming you could activate them and use them. The black cubes are uh, the supply, the mobile supply uh, units, uh, they have a different name here, but they're MSUs, right? And they uh, they move along uh, road and rail. Well, actually, they move along rail. Well, that's interesting. They're not on rail to start with. So there you go. Oh, no, that is rail. Although, although it looks like a road, that's kind of unusual. Uh, and I haven't had a detailed look at the map. I like the artwork overall. I don't really like the black edge of the map. You know, the map's got this... this kind of black edge. It's a pretty high contrast thing and it makes me feel like I'm looking at uh, Blitz Creek 41 or something. I said an 80s style. But I love the, the mountains and the, the, the forest stuff and the swamps and everything and, and uh, all, all that's very nice. The various military districts are a little bit tricky to kind of discern but not a big deal. Uh, wear your glasses when you're trying to work that out because you've got to pay attention to where the, the military districts end. So these guys are important, these, uh, these logistics units. Uh, because you, you have to be able to trace supply back to them, a certain number of, of hexes. And you have lines of communication and lines of supply. And that is also going to drive and funnel and channel your, uh, your actions and your activity. And you're not going to be able to just, uh, in the old uh, the Russian campaign mode, just run off and send one division racing off up to Leningrad to try and capture it or do something or cut somebody off or a handful of units, whatever the case may be, you're going to have to be within uh, a certain distance and range of the, the logistics units so that it all works out. The air uh, has a couple of different uh, capabilities. You can use it as combat factors to improve your attack odds, uh, or you can uh, use it for interdiction. You can also use it for supply. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of fairly standard. And then at some point, the... Um, there's the Sturm uh, counter that goes into the mix as well that allows you to uh, increase your combat attack, your, de your defense or offense by either one or two depending on what you're doing. And that improves as the war goes on for the Germans because they use more of them and you will actually think you actually get a, a second chit. And then uh, there's consolidation of forces as well. So you can start taking some... Uh, uh, cores and armies out and replacing them with guards units and all sorts of things like that and in fact some of those are mandated so there's a lot of interesting little things going on in this game that uh, made me very curious about getting it on the board uh, it has a very nice uh, where is it here you know, the terrain there's all the terrain effects charts and stuff and um, you know, how to do all your replacements and there's a turn sequence, and I've written my little, I've got a little uh, uh, reminder sheet here that I printed off, and I've added some things to it and wrote a quick summary of the rules. So we're off to the races. We're going to play the first couple of turns and see how it kind of pans out, and uh, I'll probably pop in and uh, pop up some video on it or something like that. We'll see what happens, and we'll kind of take it from there. So I thought I'd share this with you because it's up, and uh, it looks looks kind of pretty, and... Uh, it looks like it'll actually play well as well. Uh, all the little units that have black dots on them are non-replaceable forces, so once they're dead, they're dead. Um, 
set up, uh, I think I mentioned in an earlier video, uh, or maybe it hasn't popped out yet, but I mentioned that I created a little chart so that you can just grab one fours that are not in the in the military districts. So all these one four units here. Uh, you grab those and uh, you just put them down wherever they wherever you wherever they need to go. I, I created a table for that rather than trying to you know scrape through and find each individual unit and know exactly where it needs to go. It makes it a lot faster to set up for the second time. Okie dokie, I think that's it. Ciao.